Well, greetings horticultural folks and welcome to today's Grower Talks webinar. I'm Chris Bates, uh, editor of Grower Talks and Green Profit Magazines and the e-newsletter Acres Online, and I'm going to be your host for the next hour or so as we discuss, well, you see it right there on your screen, healthy water, removing pesticides and supplying oxygen to plant roots. Now, this is an important webinar uh, because water is one of those things that we as an industry take for granted. Uh, yet it's the one thing, think about this, it's the one thing you can't replace with some artificial substance. We've got man-made fertilizers, man-made substrates, even man-made light, but there is no man-made replacement for water, which is why we need to take better care of it and use it to its best advantage. And that is the focus of today's webinar. Now, I, I know a little bit about water. I'm actually drinking a glass right now, uh, but I'm never an expert on these topics. Uh, but I know who the experts are. And in this case, I went to my alma mater, the University of Florida, uh, where I found Dr. Paul Fisher to give us a hand. Welcome, Paul. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, Paul, where are you broadcasting from specifically today? Uh, I am here in beautiful Gainesville, Florida. Ah, uh, Gainesville, where uh, today in Chicago it was 19 degrees. Uh, what's the temperature down there? Oh, we're somewhere around 80. Yeah, thank you very much yeah, for that. Uh, now, warm. now yeah. those, <laughs> those of you who have been uh, been uh, following our webinars know that the last couple I've done with streaming video, where you can actually see me and, more importantly, my guests. Uh, the system that we're using, WorkCast, they've been going through some updates and upgrades and things, and they didn't quite have it ready for us to use today. Um, so we're going kind of the old-fashioned way, if there's such a thing with webinars, uh, where we've just got sound and slides. So if you don't see us... Uh, on your screen talking live. Uh, that's why. Don't adjust your sets. Um, and Paul, I wanted I want to bring up too that you were involved in two different projects down there in Gainesville, the Floriculture Research Alliance and Clean Water Three. Tell us briefly about those. Sure, Chris. So uh, Floriculture Research Alliance is something that's been going for about 15 years, and there are several universities involved, and also a bunch of really elite grower and allied companies. And so we just had our meeting in Minnesota this year, hosted by Dr. John Irwin from University of Minnesota. And uh, every year we uh, get together and, and uh, get some feedback on research priorities uh, and present our information to, to this grower group. And they're very helpful for uh, providing us with uh, ideas on what we should really be working on, what are the real key problems. And that was actually what led me into working on uh, water quality to start with was that growers mentioned that have vendors coming on onto their operations, uh, selling a piece of equipment, and a lot of the, the background for uh, water quality is very different from growing. So that's where, what got me into this, this area to start with. And then uh, about four years ago, Sarah White at Clemson University got a, a group of us together uh, on a uh, multi-state research project called Clean Water 3. And there's a bunch of different researchers working on every aspect of water quality you can imagine for irrigation. And uh, some of the res results that we're presenting today are directly out of that group. Right, loads of great information, which we are going to share, and I've been sharing it in Grower Talks as, as well. And your accent, just so folks know, you're from New Zealand originally, correct? I am. I am. Just yeah, well, don't, don't want to mix you uh, up with, with an Aussie or, or something else, right? That, that, that's <laughs> right. You've been you've been down under, and you know how important that is. <laughs> All right. And, uh, well, as always, I'm broadcasting from the 103rd floor of the uh, Ball Publishing Broadcast Studios. Okay, some quick housekeeping before we dive into the, the all-important topic of the day. If you have questions, there is an Ask a Question module off to the side of your screen somewhere over there. Uh, open that up, type it in. Uh, I will field them as we go along if it's pertinent to the, the topic that Paul happens to be on. Otherwise, we'll save them for the Q&A area at the end. Uh, we've already had one question. Uh, Olu wants to know uh, about the archive. The webinar will be archived at the same place you signed up for, growtalks.com slash webinars. And usually within about an hour or two of the conclusion of the event, uh, I do my best to get it up there right away. Uh, I'll share that again, that address at the at the very end. And I've got to thank our sponsor, BASF, in this particular case, because they put the free 
in free webinar. So thank you very much for BASF. And uh, is that all my uh, housekeeping stuff? It is. Paul, why don't you just dive in and talk about healthy water? Sounds great. Well, thank you very much, Chris, to Grow Talks and BASF for uh, putting on this uh, webinar today. And I'm going to talk about uh, healthy water in a couple of different ways. And first thing is, what do I mean by healthy water? Well, you know, I, I went online and looked looked in with good old Google at at what healthy water options are out there, and and it came up with a very interesting little uh, evaluation of drinking bottled water here and. And, you know, people get right into uh, some details about uh, water quality, being voluptuous, full body, the cabinet of water. Well, when it comes to irrigation, we just need to have this be good enough for agriculture. So there isn't one water quality that's essential. But what we want to do is provide our crops with water that is healthy, meaning that the contaminants that are present are at a level that will do no harm. And we're going to focus on pesticides and plant growth regulators, but there are plenty of other contaminants that potentially could be in your irrigation water. And in fact, we don't even need or even necessarily want our water to be completely pure because pure water from rainwater or reverse osmosis in some ways can be a, a hungry water. It can draw ions that cause corrosion in our pipes. And pure water has no buffering to change in pH. Or, and doesn't provide any nutrients like calcium, magnesium. So, so we're going to focus on removing pesticides and plant growth regulators to a level that they are not going to cause any issues for our crops. And the other aspect that we'll talk about is air management, which in some ways is the opposite of water management. And uh, I saw online, I read, read an interesting article recently that uh, they're now going up into some of these pristine mountain areas with a compressor and sucking up air, bottling it, and then selling it to people living in smoggy cities to have a quick inhale of some, some uh, pure air. And what that air and oxygen means when it comes to irrigation water is a couple of things. One of them is that there is some of the oxygen which plants need to respire and breathe just like we do. Some of that oxygen can be dissolved in water. So we call that dissolved oxygen. And then the other part of oxygen is coming through the air. And if we're growing in a container substrate, then the large spaces, the large pores are filled with air and oxygen is present um, in, that, in that air. And so when we overwater, we fill up all of those pores with water rather than air and we get less oxygen to roots. So there's a couple of aspects of, of oxygen management around water that I'm going to talk about today. So before we get started, Chris, you already uh, um, laid the, the groundwork for me here just to thank these two groups that I work with, uh, Clean Water 3. Um, we've got a, uh, a website called cleanwater3.org, which has got a bunch of different resources related to today's topics. And then also uh, the Floriculture Research Alliance. If you look down that list of of growers and allied companies. It's a very elite group that help not only in terms of funding, but uh, also in terms of providing ideas um, and priorities. And I'd just like to give a shout out to American Floral Endowment and Horticultural Research Institute, who are uh, two of our industry partners that really help promote this, um, uh, this type of funding that we have for um, our, our projects. Now, what we'll do first is talk about remediating, remediating agrochemicals and irrigation water. And the image that you're seeing on the left side there is granular activated carbon. Um, and we're going to talk about these GAC filters. And on the right side, you can see um, a, uh, a pipe with effluent coming out from a nursery. And the challenge with agrochemicals in our water is that uh, they can be present and have impacts on the crops if we are capturing and reusing water. And it's also a regulatory issue if we are um, having runoff from our operations. So we're going to use Paclobutrazole, which most of our growers are going to be familiar with in terms of the trade names Bonsai or Downsize, Paxol, Piccolo, Piccolo 10 XC. This is a plant growth regulator that's very widely used. It affects so many 
uh, so many plants. I was just down uh, choosing uh, peclobutrazole drench rates for our poinsettias for our trials coming up um, just yesterday. So it's very effective PGR, gives us compact plants, but it has a six month half-life in water. And we apply this material as a spray or a drench or a subrogation. It's so effective on so many crops, um, but it is persistent. And if we are collecting any of that overspray or if we're, we're actually applying the chemical through our irrigation system, um, it's not all going onto the foliage or into the soil, then it can accumulate in our recirculated irrigation water. And even though we're applying it at rates up to a couple of hundred parts a million in terms of a spray, the effect on certain crops uh, is at a very, very low concentration. And so we're familiar with talking about parts per million or milligrams per liter, but when we're thinking about these residual effects of agrochemicals, it's down in the parts per billion kind of a range. And so in this study here, in this table, it was done uh, back by Jim Barrett and uh, Jeff Million and colleagues back in 2002, and they showed if you had a, either a single irrigation application or continuous with every irrigation, uh, what the concentration in parts per billion of paclobutrazole was that would cause a very significant reduction in bedding plants. And so you can see our canary in the coal mine when it comes to paclobutrazole is begonia. And at 10 parts per billion with a single application or five parts per billion with continual application, you would get a very severe stunting of begonias. And one of the things that I did with Rosa Raudales uh, from University of Connecticut and James Altland from USDA ARS is we went and we looked at the levels of paclobutrazole in tanks or catchment ponds in greenhouses that were using paclobutrazole. And we found rates anywhere from not present up to around 50 parts per billion. And what we're looking at here in this photo at the bottom is where student Victor Zayas applied over a three week period with each irrigation he applied 50, 10, five or zero parts per billion of paclobutrazole with each irrigation. And so again, 50 parts per billion is 0 0.05 parts per million of paclobutrazole. So you can see a lot of stunting, even with five parts per billion, you can clearly see the impact of that chemical. And this kind of stunting from PGRs we apply ourselves isn't the only situation where we run into pesticide contamination as an issue of our irrigation water. In this case, a greenhouse grower was irrigating from a pond water source and a residual herbicide was applied by a utility company to land in the catchment area of the pond and it resulted in runoff of this chemical into the surface water supply. And when plants were irrigated with this pond water, they had twisted growth shown at the top right. And that's typical of the hormonal effects of a herbicide toxicity. So if you're irrigating with the surface water, there is some risk associated with pesticide residues from your neighbors. In addition to that, we have increasing regulation of runoff. And one of the partners in our uh, Clean Water 3 group is Jim Owen at uh, Virginia Tech University. And both he and Tom Fernandez up at Michigan State University are looking at runoff of these pesticides from nurseries. And what they can see is even though that most of the, uh, the chemical is likely to be absorbed by the, the foliage or the soil, it's quite possible for some of that uh, chemical to leach into the runoff from the greenhouse. Now, when it comes to measuring the levels of chemical contaminants, then we can do chemical analysis, which I'll talk about next, but there is also a method that you can use in your own operation and that is called a bioassay. And this basically just means what is the biological effect of this contaminant? And so this is one of the things that, that we were doing at the University of Florida. Um, and what we would do is we would sample some irrigation water. And then we would apply 
the water, either the contaminated material uh, with no treatment, contaminated after we'd passed it through a carbon filter, or else fresh water as our control that wasn't contaminated. And so we could see, if, was there some suppression of growth from the contamination of, of the chemical? Um, and was our treatment with a carbon filter, was that effective? So to do a bioassay, you just take some seeds or a sensitive plug, such as a, a begonia plug. We use broccoli seeds. And then you irrigate with the recycled water you think is contaminated, fresh water from a non-contaminated source. That's your control. And then if you're doing some kind of treatment, then you can uh, test if you think about carbon filtration, by the way, then you can go to a, a big box hardware store and purchase a, a kitchen scale carbon filter and test it out to see whether it's likely to be effective to, to remove this effect, to remove the effect of their chemical. And then you simply grow the plants for a period of weeks and compare their growth. <coughs> now, a bioassay is going to tell you something about whether your water is not healthy, whether it's impacting growth, but I won't tell you exactly what the problem was. And so if you want to get a chemical analysis, then you need to find a laboratory that specializes in this type of analysis. So for example, with the studies we were doing at Paclobutrazole, we both worked on a research scale with USDA, but also sent samples off to the Waters Ag Lab in, in Georgia, and they did an excellent job of um, providing us with feedback. But what the challenge is, is that you need to know specifically what you want to test for before you send a sample to a lab, because it's usually going to be at least $50 or more for each chemical that they test in the water sample. So you have to have an idea, rather than go on a fishing expedition, you have to have an idea specifically what chemical you suspect is the problem. And then you also need to interpret the, the information. And so in a few cases, such as paclobutrazole, we know that five parts per billion or more is a problem, but you don't necessarily have that information uh, for some of the other chemicals. Paul, let me ask a real quick question there. Can you, can you sure. give them sort of a list of common uh, uh, herbicide uh, active ingredients and have them look for a list of half a dozen different things? Or are they going to uh, only can. look for one thing at a time at $50 each? Yeah, you, you can give them a list but uh, they will have to calibrate their equipment for each of those chemicals that they're testing for. And so um, it, it can rack up some cost pretty quickly. Got you, okay, thanks. All right, so yeah, so that is the challenge. Um, so, so I would start with a bioassay, it would be, it would be quite a good, good starting point. And then think about uh, looking back at pesticide history, look at uh, what might have been applied on land around your, your property and so on, and then go for the chemical analysis. So let's, let's move on to a specific grower case study. And this was uh, run by uh, one of my graduate students, George Grant, did an excellent job working with a partner grower who would very much like to thank. They want to stay anonymous, but they have done a fantastic job on this project. And what they were doing was they were uh, applying a paclobutrazole through their sub-irrigation system. They had an ever flood greenhouse and they were getting some uh, level of suppression of growth for future crops. So they ended up really leading the way for our industry and installing a granular activated carbon filtration system. And so the return water would come back into a return tank and then slowly over time pass through these carbon filters to be stored as cleaned water for use on, on the next crop. And some specifics here are that this grower uh, had three GAC filters in series. Each of them was 264 gallons. And you can get an idea of the scale from the photo there. And the important thing here when it comes to GAC filtration is that it's a very simple very effective technology, but it needs a big filter. And the faster the flow rate is, the bigger the filter needs to be. So, so these filters might run almost 24 hours a day to um, be able to fill up a cleaned water tank because your return flow rate through a greenhouse of any size is gonna be a lot more than 50 gallons per minute. But what this grower was trying to do was to get 10 minutes of contact time and we'll go back into that and re-emphasize that 
So the faster the flow rate, the more time uh, and the larger, sorry, the larger the filter needs to be. And what the grower did was they were really diligent about collecting samples pre-GAC, so that's before the filter and after post-GAC filtration over a series of weeks. And we wouldn't say that you need to do weekly, fil uh, weekly monitoring. I think um, uh, monthly is quite adequate, but this grower again was really uh, striking out um, ahead of the pack here. And so what you can see is that the average uh, level of paclobutrazol in parts per billion was 11.9 parts per billion before the filter and 0 0.4 parts per billion after the filter. And keeping in mind this threshold of five parts per billion, you can see that that some of these levels going all the way up to 72 and a half parts per billion, that is definitely enough paclobutrazol essentially drenching the next crop if you just use that, that water straight. And if you went through the growing season, like many of our greenhouse operations, they had different crops with different amounts of paclobutrazol being applied, first bedding plants, then a lot of paclo with chrysanthemums and smaller rate with poinsettias. And one of the uh, things that the grower did, and one of the main questions that, that, that people have about GAC filters is, when do you need to replace the carbon, these particles inside the GAC filters? Because the carbon filters work by adsorbing the pesticides to the surface of these particles. And eventually, these exchange sites there become saturated with chemical and the carbon needs to be reconditioned or replaced by a specialist filter company. So usually the company that provides you with the carbon filter uh, material is also able to recondition it and replace in, in your filter. And so in this uh, case, the had grower a, Christine had a question about that. Sure. Christine, yeah, she had a yeah. question about how disposing of, the, of the, uh, the carbon, but I think you've just answered that. Yeah, so I would, I would uh, be in communication with that with your carbon particle supplier uh, because they can recondition that carbon for future reuse because yes you're right it's going to be loaded with pesticides and other chemicals um, over time and so right. you know you really need to budget for this replacement of, of the carbon um, particles which is basically uh, going to be in, in most situations with a sub irrigation system is going to be once a year um, but you can see that that even though the grower uh, replaced uh, the filter in week 33, that yellow line there, the, the post-filter paclobutrazol levels were still very low. So the, the carbon actually was still functioning quite well. It's just the grower was, again, um, uh, being risk averse and, and making sure that there was no breakthrough of, of, this, uh, of these pesticides. So um, overall, you know, the, all of the uh, the, the PECLO levels were below our target threshold of five parts per billion for begonias. That threshold is actually higher for um, many of the other crops that we grow. But um, the, the filter throughout that period that they were measuring PECLO levels before and after filtration, uh, they knew that if they had no filter, they would be impacting crops with the filter, then they were in great shape. And one of the follow-ups that George Grant did was that he tested a bunch of different chemicals to see whether those other chemicals would also be removed by the GAC filters. Because if you look under EPA guidelines, carbon filtration is often the recommended treatment system for many pesticide spills or contaminants. And you can see here we've got insecticides, herbicides, plant growth regulators, sanitizers and disinfectants and other agrochemicals. And I'm gonna spend a little bit of time going through why we tested these different, these different chemicals. So the insecticides, herbicides, and plant growth regulators are all important because those are potential contaminants. For example, a herbicide, we already saw that example of herbicides in pond water that could have an impact on, on crops. So these would be chemicals we would typically want to remove. So we've got a con controlled dose. We've got healthy water for our subsequent crop. When it comes to the sanitizers and disinfectants, then they're important because sometimes you want to treat your water 
for, for example, Pythium, Phytophthora, or some other uh, waterborne pathogen, E. coli, whatever, in a hydroponic system. But then you want to remove the residual of that sanitizer because there can be some phytotoxicity, especially in hydroponics, from uh, these chemicals. So, so sometimes a GAC filter can be used after a sanitizer has been applied. You've got the contact time, you've got the kill of the microorganisms. You then filter with a particle filter and then a GAC filter. The other two, they're the fertilizer dye and the iron EDDHA. They're important for a couple of reasons. The fertilizer dye, you know, most of the fertilizer, water-soluble fertilizer we use has got a blue color to it. You will see a color change if that filter is working. So it's actually a visual um, check, not a very quantitative one, but it's a visual check that the, the carbon filter is taking some uh, chemicals, organic chemicals, out of solution. The iron EDDHA is important because not only is iron EDDHA, that's a particular chelate, it's the red iron, it also will go through a color change. But if you continually recirculate a nutrient solution through a carbon filter, it will remove the chelated iron. So you end up having to, to replace back some of that iron fertilizer level um, in a recirculating system. Paul, we've got a quick question kind of on the topic from uh, Matthew, good. who specifically specifically wants to know about Roundup uh, glyphosate um, and if that, how much of an issue you think that is as a, as a runoff herbicide. I've, I've always heard it's tied up pretty well by the, by the soil and, um, and isn't as big an issue, but what have you seen? Yeah, well, that's, that's my understanding as well, um, and uh, I think we're all uh, watching with interest in terms of uh, uh, lawsuits and, oh, uh, well, yep. and registration of, gl of glyphosate around the world. Um, you know, we're, we are in um, a situation in the United States where uh, we uh, have some regulations in place in terms of pesticide runoff, including um, herbicides. We are not enforced to the level that we could be. Um, and, but that is absolutely happening in the Netherlands already. And so they are, uh, in many of their greenhouse operations, they are installing some of these treatment systems specifically for their runoff, as opposed to just recirculating water inside the greenhouse. So one of the good things is that GAC as, as one of these uh, treatment options is uh, pretty effective across the board for most of the uh, likely uh, pesticide issues that we, we're going to face. Hmm, might right, might become a regular right. part of the uh, the irrigation system. Hang on, we got a couple more. <laughs> the questions are okay, rolling great. in. Uh, keep, Lori, keep coming. Uh, Lori says that their greenhouse used a carbon filtration system for another reason, and we're surprised that they saw an unexpected increase in water pH. Can that be linked to the, okay. to the carbon? Okay. Um, An increase in pH. I don't know how. Yeah, I I don't know how that would have a direct impact. Um, and Laurie, be very welcome to follow up with me because the uh, the carbon filter um, it won't remove alkalinity. It won't remove um, sodium and chloride, for example. Um, so um, so. I'm, I'm not sure exactly what the mechanism for that would be, to be honest. Could it have been removing, um, and, removing and, a chemical that caused pH, uh, that lowered the pH? Could it be removing um, something that lowered the pH? Unlikely, unlikely. So um, it, it may be that, uh, that the water had very low alkalinity already. And so by the time it had gone through the treatment system, it was very unbuffered and the pH had changed. But um, I would not expect that to be an issue, and I've not seen that as, as an issue. All right, Laurie, we'll give you uh, uh, Paul's email address at the end. You can suss this one yeah, out. And Valerie's asking about copper because they use a copper ionization uh, system. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, there is potential there for copper to be adsorbed onto um, a, a carbon filter just because copper is... is um, of all of the micronutrients, copper is most 
um, uh, likely to uh, be adsorbed onto exchange sites, including in peat, for example. So uh, there could be a reduction in the copper level. All right, carry on, my friend. And so, so yeah. So what what that would mean is is um, you know you would really need to um, think about measuring before and after the filtration um, in terms of of copper. Um, I don't know anyone who has um, has used it in that way, but but um, it, it, you'd have to be very careful in terms of the point of the GAC filter versus the point of copper um, uh, ionization. Okay, so let's keep on let's keep on moving. I like these questions. So um, uh, one of the key things is uh, for a GAC filter to work is that it can easily get fouled up by particles and also by biofilm growing on the filter. So you need to pre-filter before you, um, have, with a particle filter, before um, water goes through a GAC filter. And you may need to have some sanitation as well. Um, if you just took pond water and you put it straight through a GAC filter, it will gunk up very quickly because you're gonna get biofilm and algae growing in the in the filter and um, you'll also get just some particles clogging it up another thing then the other biggest challenge is in terms of the volume of the filter and so um, you want to try to design for a 15 to 1 volume to flow rate ratio and so that means if you've got 100 gallons per minute flow rate you want it to be flowing through the filter for 15 minutes, so you'd need 15 times 100, you need a 1500 gallon volume of filtration. And so because of the size of these filters, then uh, you, it's most efficient to have a near continuous, near 24 hour filtration at a slow flow rate. Now relative to the cost of other water treatments, and we'll mention ozone and UV for example in a moment, then GAC filters are really a low cost option. And so this gives you a little budget breakdown. You're gonna to have to pay for the filter. Um, there's gonna be a pump and a pre-filter to take out particles. You're gonna change the GAC out once a year. It's gonna be a little bit of labor associated with maintaining it. And we would recommend monthly testing. So overall for this particular operation, we've got an estimate for a 20 acre operation of around uh, $11,680 per year. Okay, so let's move on to ozone, unless you've got any other questions, Chris, to, to throw out there. Nope, okay, so, so if we look at some of the other technology options, ozone is a very strong oxidizer. We went out to Lucas Greenhouse out in, uh, in New Jersey. We worked with Lucas, we worked with Metroliner, they've been wonderful. Uh, to share uh, some of the results with their equipment. We spiked a couple of the sub-irrigation tanks at Lucas with, uh, with some uh, paclobutrazole, and we then passed it through their sand filters and their ozone system and measured what came out the other end. And what we found was that basically a bit more than half of the paclobutrazole went, was uh, oxidized by the ozone system with each pass through the system. So you could potentially um, have that water circulating through the ozone system more than once to clean up uh, any uh, pesticide residues. Uh, the, the challenge with ozone, um, one is that it's got a high initial cost and it's a complex piece of equipment. So you really need to have the capital and you need to have a really well-trained person on your staff uh, to manage this because you're really, starting to have a real water treatment system in your operation, whereas the GAC filter is just like having another filter, just like a sand filter. And you're also gonna need a very high level of pre-filtration, uh, just as you will with all of these different systems. And I should mention that we did that project with Rosa Raudalis at University of Connecticut when we were visiting Lucas. And uh, Rosa and I also looked at um, UV radiation. Uh, there was a UV system at Lucas and again, that will that will break down some uh, paclobutrazole or residues. But again, you've got a, a, a piece of equipment that's expensive uh, initially to purchase, um, especially if you've got high flow rates. And again, it's going to be sensitive to particles in the water. That's turbidity, lack of clarity of the water, because you've got to pass a, a beam 
um, of UV light through to, to break down uh, the molecules and it needs good, a good level of prefiltration. Another option is reverse osmosis. So this type of very fine membrane filter will take out pesticides. Again, um, it's uh, fairly expensive, as, as, especially as flow rate goes up. You need to have some pretreatment to take out particles um, and to uh, kill any bacteria that might uh, form biofilm on the membranes. You may need to then remove that sanitizer residual to stop damaging the membranes. And you're going to have some brine sol um, solution, including the concentrated pesticides that you'd need to dispose of. So brine disposal is starting to become quite an issue depending on uh, what part of the US that you're in. Then there's some biological options as well. Uh, those include um, having a slow sand filter where there is a layer of bacteria that are uh, on the top of uh, these filters. They're much slower uh, in terms of flow rate as, as implied by their name compared with a typical sand filter. Um, but Lauren Oakey and his team at University of California and the Clean Water 3 project are working on that topic. And then also constructed wetlands. The biological activity is water passes through uh, either um, a constructed wetland or floating, uh, floating plants in that wetland area that's being researched by uh, Clemson University and they're showing some reduction in pesticides as it water runs off through through the system. And then yet another option, which is being looked at by Tom Fernandez at Michigan State University, is with a carbon bioreactor, which is <coughs> excuse me, a, a fairly simple type of system where the runoff water is passed through wood chips, which through a combination of adsorption of the pesticide onto the wood chips and biological decomposition will break down those pesticides. And then, you know, even though it's not buying a nice shiny piece of equipment, uh, I got to say that uh, prevention is the, is the best policy. And so following best management practices, uh, Tom Yeager here at University of Florida and others have developed um, some very good BMPs for pesticide handling. And those BMPs mean, for example, avoiding uh, having uh, pesticide product going into the runoff to start with. So applying the product directly to the container, um, securing pesticide storage, having vegetative buffer strips around waterways, and using non-residual pesticides and biological controls and cultural methods that reduce the, the overall uh, pesticide load in your operation. So before we move on to the next topic, just to recap, some agrochemicals are persistent in water. We use paclobutrazole as our example, six month half-life. Test your irrigation water if you suspect there's an issue. We talked about a bioassay, but also sending a sample off to a lab if you know what to test for. For recirculated water, I think the number one technology in terms of cost and simplicity is a GAC filter, but there are other options, ozone, UV radiation, and membrane filtration, but especially if you've got those technologies in place for other reasons as well can be effective. <coughs> if you want to treat runoff water from your greenhouse or nursery before it goes into the environment, then because you've got a lot of water quantity, it's probably got quite a lot of suspended solids and organic matter, it'd be hard to clean it up to pass through any of these other technologies, then something biological is most likely to be effective. And then using BMPs is and avoiding agrochemical contamination to start with is also, of course, very much advised. So, Paul, Chris, do we, we have any uh, questions before we, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we do. We've mm -hmm. got uh, specifically about uh, carbon, which seems to be the interesting topic of the, uh, of the day here. Uh, Bill wants to know um, if you need storage capacity for the treated water or you just run it out through the system uh, as you need it. Yeah, so uh, great question, and the answer is, Yes, because the way you're typically going to plumb this is, let's say that you're using uh, an ebb and flood irrigation system, then when that re return water uh, comes back, it's coming back at a very high flow rate. And it's probably going out to crops, coming back and um, being cycled over multiple times. From that return tank, you then want to have a 
a, a pump that is going at a moderate to, to low flow rate through your particle filter, then through your GAC filter, and then into a cleansed tank. And that might happen overnight, for example. And from that clean tank, then starting off the next morning, then you're going to um, have some treated water. So yeah, you'll definitely be um, uh, requiring to have, have some extra water storage. Uh, makes perfect uh, sense in that case. Uh, and Sarah wants to know uh, if uh, carbon uh, removes some of the pathogens in the water. Yeah, so not really. Um, so uh, uh, the, if, we, if we're te dealing with waterborne pathogens, then um, now, we're, now we're looking at sanitizing technologies. Now, you look at the technologies that are on the, the screen right in front of us, there are some of these other options. Ozone, UV radiation would be examples of technologies that also um, are very effective sanitizers. And uh, slow sand filtration also can take out uh, plant pathogens, wet, uh, constructive wetlands. But um, you know, really we're talking about, when it comes to water quality, we've got chemical issues. We've just talked about the agrochemical part. We've got biological issues like these plant pathogens. And then we've got physical issues, which are suspended particles that we need to filter out as our main, main groups. And so you really want to identify what your goals are, um, of what's the problem you're dealing with, and then pick the right solution. And, uh, and a GA super filter is not going to be the right solution for a plant pathogen issue. Excellent. All right, that's it on that portion. Take us into dissolved oxygen. Or All water right. and air management. Okay, so <clears throat> water and air management and DO. Okay, so so this is work that a uh, graduate student of mine, um, Aaron Yafuso, has been doing a great job with this project. Uh, there's a postdoc, Dr. Anna Borges, and a colleague, James Altland, in USDA. And, um, you know, just a couple of things about oxygen. Well, well plant roots need oxygen to respire, and uh, also the top of the plant uh, during the night needs oxygen. And, you think about where oxygen is present, it's in, present in the air as well as in water. And if you think of oxygen as a gas present in the atmosphere, if it's at 25 degrees Celsius in the mid 70s in Fahrenheit at one atmosphere, then we've got 271 milligrams of oxygen in one liter of air. And in contrast, if you look at um, dissolved oxygen in water, you've got 8.3 milligrams of oxygen, O2, um, per liter of water um, at the same kind of temperature. And so very first thing you can see is there's a, a lot more oxygen in air than there is in water. Um, and when it comes to dissolved oxygen in water, it's less soluble as high temperatures increase. So, you know, one of the situations with hydroponics, for example, in the summertime is DO levels can get very low um, in uh, an irrigation recirculated hydroponic solution because of that high temperature. Now, another thing is that oxygen moves through air many, many times more quickly than it does through water. Water is not a very good delivery system for oxygen. Now, it is possible to, um, to add extra oxygen beyond that saturation level so that you can have super saturated water. And so that's what one of the first things we did in this project was we had an ozone system and the first stage in ozone was to feed the ozone system with purified oxygen from the air. So we turned off the ozone, which is O3. It's a, that's a different technology. And we just looked at the O2 and we were able to get about three times the saturation level. So somewhere 25 to 30 milligrams per liter of oxygen and, and using the system, okay? So, so it is possible to inject oxygen into water. And that is different. Oxygen O2 is not the same as ozone O3. Now, ozone, as it breaks down, will form oxygen in water. Um, but ozone is a different beast. It's a very strong oxidizer and sanitizer. So we've done projects, for example, looking at ozone, um, especially at Lucas Greenhouse at a commercial scale. And we know that when water passes through an ozone system, that ozone is such a strong oxidizer, it'll kill bacteria. Um, it'll even break down some of the iron chelates 
and as we said before, some of the pesticides. Oxygen, though, is nowhere near as active as ozone. So we're going to be talking about oxygen, dissolved oxygen, and not dissolved ozone here. <coughs> so when does it make sense to oxygenate, uh, oxygenate, add oxygen to our irrigation water? Well, one of the situations is with pond water. And the reason there is that as we add oxygen into a pond, then we get more nutrient turnover, more biological activity, we get less algae growth, and uh, the nutrient levels can go down. So, so we'll tend to have a healthier irrigation pond if we are moving water, and especially if we're moving water and adding air at the same time. So it's very common for um, uh, to add air into an irrigation pond. This is at uh, Metroliner with uh, uh, an aeration system uh, that they've installed there for water quality. Another situation where it makes sense to add oxygen into water is if we've got certain chemical water quality issues. So dissolved iron, dissolved manganese, we will either add oxygen directly or uh, we can add chlorine or some other um, oxidizer uh, in the earth that'll um, make that dissolved iron and dissolved manganese form rust particles uh, that we can then filter out. And the little picture there of those drippers, for example, is uh, from CubePack where they installed a potassium permanganate system Potassium permanganate is an oxidizer, just like ozone or chlorine or chlorine dioxide is. And that turned their dissolved iron into rust particles that they could then filter out. Hydrogen sulfide, I don't know if you ever ran into this, Chris, here in Florida, but we have stinky water sometimes. And that's water that is very anaerobic. And so you add oxygen into hydrogen sulfide um, contaminated water, then it'll turn that sulfide into sulfate which is like the, the uh, fertilizer form of sulfur, which is um, not, not stinky, okay? Hydroponics is another situation where it's really important to provide air and water. And that's because the roots are completely bathed in water and the only oxygen those roots, which need the oxygen to respire, the only oxygen they're gonna get is through dissolved oxygen. And there's good research work from plant pathologists showing that when the DO, the dissolved oxygen level, gets down to around two parts per million. It's very likely to get root death, and a plant pathogen such as Pythium comes in very quickly after that. Now, there are a lot of studies where they've super saturated uh, water, and the jury is out uh, with hydroponics as to whether that's really beneficial or not. Most of the research work overall indicates that it's important to bring oxygen level in your hydroponic solution up to somewhere close to saturation, there are definitely negative problems happen when you are, um, uh, you've got low DO, but not much evidence when there's a high DO level, okay, when it's up to 25, 30 parts per million. Okay, the other situation when it helps, it, it kind of makes sense to oxygenate is if you're completely waterlogged. And so, you know, we started it out there, Chris, as, as mentioned, I'm a, I'm a Kiwi. So if I choose research work that I want to criticize, it usually comes from Australia. And that was this case here. And so what they did in this study was they took corn plants and they put them in a pot filled with vermiculite growing media. They blocked off the bottom of the container and then they pumped water through that container. And that water either was aerated to increase the dissolved oxygen level, or it was non-aerated. And so the only oxygen those roots got was then in this waterlogged bucket. And in that situation, yes, not surprisingly, in this waterlogged condition, they got more corn ear weight, more yield under aerated conditions than non-aerated. But the other way to look at that is maybe uh, put some drain holes in the container and let some oxygen come in. And when we have looked at oxygenation of water in a couple of situations, both in mist propagation, which you can see at the top there, or when we're irrigating geraniums 
um, in containers, both top watering and subrogating, and we're using either ambient water, which has got about seven milligrams per liter of DO, or oxygenated water up around 25 per, um, parts per million of dissolved oxygen. We have never seen an effect of oxygenation when we are growing in containers. Okay, so why, why is that? We haven't seen it in mist, and we haven't seen it when growing in containers. Well, one of the things is, if we are passing th water through fine mist nozzles, it quickly brings water to oxygen saturation. And Aaron went out and measured DO levels of water going into a, a boom or into a mist system. And then when the water has passed through that fine, uh, that fine pore size, it's got lots of little droplets that are exposed to air and quickly comes to saturation. So our mist system or our boom irrigation system is actually a very effective oxygenator of our irrigation water. So you've got well water coming up. By the time you, you use that in propagation and put it through a boom, you know, we've never seen a problem coming out of booms of water having low DO. So that's probably why we didn't see an effect of uh, oxygenating a water in, in a mist propagation system because the extra oxygen just off gassed into the air by the time the water came down to the growing media. And when we were growing in containers, then uh, even though we were able to increase the DO in the irrigation water, most of the oxygen actually comes from the air spaces in the container substrate. So a root substrate that's got large air spaces is another cheap oxygenation system for plants grown in containers because oxygen moves through air way faster than it does through water. And here's an even cheaper oxygenation system, which is to turn off the tap. And why is that? Well, if we're growing in containers and we've got a porous mix, that if we allow it to dry down and we get air spaces in there, oxygen will come in very quickly. So does it make sense to add oxygen into a container production by our water? Or is it better to let the pot dry down and deliver our oxygen through air? Now, one of the websites that I manage is called backpocketgrower.org. You can go there uh, under training and under irrigation and you'll see that one to five moisture scale, one being bone dry to five being very saturated that are used especially by plug growers. And there are training videos in English and Spanish that are there available for free. So just look at this one to five moisture scale here. And what we can do is we can put that onto a graph here where it's as we go from left to right, it's very, very wet on the left side, very dry, on the right side. And we're looking at the percentage of a propagation cell. This is like a 102 count, 84 count cell, 20 milliliters, 20 cubic centimeters. When we are at a moisture level of five, then 80% of that cell is filled with water roughly. As we dry it down, just air drying it, we get less and less water. Typically we're, you know, if we're going through wet dry cycles, we're somewhere letting the, the plant uh, dry down, the media dry down to moisture level three or two, somewhere in, somewhere in this middle range of, of the graph. Okay, so as it dries down, of course, there's, by definition, there's less water. Okay, so, so if we had all of the water in our cell, in our propagation cell here in the tray, was at saturation, this would be how much dissolved oxygen there would be in the water-filled pores. Okay, so not, not very much. This is the milligrams of oxygen in a propagation cell, and that's what oxygen is coming from water. But if we look also at the oxygen in the air spaces, there is way more, especially as we start drying down, way, way more oxygen in air. Okay, so you can see that if we go from moisture level five and we let that media uh, dry down to moisture level three, we've just supplied way more oxygen than those roots can ever actually use. So, so 
drying down a cell is key to providing oxygen to roots. If we look at any growing media, it's going to, uh, and we look at a container where we go from the bottom of the container here all the way up to 30 centimeters. 30 centimeters is 12 inches. Okay, so we're looking at the bottom of the container moving up to the top of the container. And we look at how much of the volume is filled with water, air, or solid. Then down near the bottom of the container, we get lots of water and we don't get very much air. As we move up in the container, then because of gravity, the water is mostly down the bottom of the container and we get more and more airspace. And one of the things that we've been doing is really trying to understand some of the physics of what happens for air and water inside propagation mixes. So here's a scanning electron uh, microscopy image of Oasis foam growing media on the left. And it's also, the, here's a CT scan. Uh, we put our cells into a CT scanner. I'll show you some more images of, of Oasis. And you see this matrix of little, little and large holes. Now, what we can do is that we're, we're looking at a, a propagation cell with Oasis growing media, and we're moving up from the bottom of the cell up to the top. That's what's showing in the left side. On the right side, if it's a white color, it's water, and the black bits are where we've got air. And so you can really see that we've got the saturated zone, and as we go up in this propagation mix, then we get more and more air. And this is one of the reasons why Oasis is such a great media for propagating poinsettias in Florida in the summer is that you can pour on water and even at the top of that, that growing mix, there's always going to be some air supply. Okay, so that's foam, Oasis foam. Well, peat is a different kind of a, a root substrate. It's got a different quality. It's got all of these organic types of um, pores in it. And if we look at that same scale here, then what we're looking at here is we've got um, uh, some black spaces in here, which are our air spaces. And then we've got all of these other um, uh, organic matrices that we're looking at. And it's quite a different profile of water and air. And this is a fine peat moss. We'd see a lot bigger air spaces if we were uh, had a coarse peat. Okay, so we get a much more even water air distribution and a peat based mix. It's, we call that matrix potential, the ability of that, that growing media to hold water against gravity. Okay, and so what that means is if you've got really simple mist controllers and coarse emitters, big droplets, then you need a substrate that has high air porosity even when it's overwatered, right? Because because you need a mix that's going to have some air spaces in it. And so this is looking at a leaf flapper type mist controller and a gravel growing media, not a very good quality growing media. But this is from Walters Gardens and they are propagating perennials at a very, very high level with a beautiful greenhouse and peat based mix, but they have very good control of their irrigation system. And here again, this is one way to look at, look at the importance of drying down your substrate to provide air. On the left, we've got rock wool at a high moisture level at, at moisture level five. On the right, we've got the same media, but we've let it dry, dry down to moisture level three. So we just want to emphasize, we want to provide oxygen to roots. We let the root substrate dry down and um, especially if you've got um, um, a poor quality irrigation system, then you need to have a mix that's got plenty of aeration to it. So take home messages about water and oxygen. DO, dissolved oxygen is important in ponds. It's important in hydroponics. It's especially important not to get a low DO level. With container production, we want to have a substrate, a, a growing mix that's got adequate air porosity and let the substrate di dry down in order to provide oxygen through air. If we've got a substrate such as foam, it'll quickly dry down and provide air even under high mist conditions. And if we've got a really good irrigation system, then we can get excellent mix of water and air in a substrate such as peat.
So with that, I'm going to, we're right on, uh, right on the hour there, Chris, sorry to go a little long here, but <laughs> just mentioned that there's a couple of, um, couple of websites available, uh, Clean Water 3, and then we also do some online extension courses you can check out as well. Those are great resources. Like I said, I use them a lot uh, for Grower Talks Magazine. We've got, uh, we've, well, we don't have time for questions, but we're going to take them anyway because folks have been waiting uh, patiently for them. We've only got just a few because we covered most of them. Uh, Ms. Sale wants to know, um, pretty general question, well water or city water for irrigation? What say you? I'm sure it depends. Okay, so <laughs> yeah, okay, so so one of the things about well water and city water is typically those are our best biological quality waters. So um, so usually the issues we run into with well water and municipal water are chemical issues, um, and that's not always the case, but that but that's that's usually the case. So if we take well if we take city water for a moment. It's usually been chlorinated or certainly had some sanitation treatment. So very unlikely to have plant pathogens in it, um, unlikely to have bacteria in it, but you could have high alkalinity, high, um, high salts. Um, so the types of treatment systems you're likely to think about needing uh, may be um, uh, acid injection for alkalinity, possibly RO for taking out reverse osmosis, for taking out salts. Well, well water is often pretty similar to that. Um, however, with a shallow well, um, you, you might have, um, especially um, here in Florida, for example, we, we get uh, microbes in the, in the well uh, water, uh, which can cause a lot of biofilm issues. Um, and sometimes we'll have particle issues as well where we need to get extra particle filtration. Um, the and other, the other the, difference the is, you know, we looked at, yeah, we looked at cost of irrigation water around the country Typically, well water costs you somewhere around 20 cents per thousand gallons. In some places, some of our growers, for example, in Denver, are paying six dollars per thousand gallons of water. Wow! And uh, that's that's uh, municipal supply. So when you're paying a lot of money like that for water, you think about how many gallons your operation would use. Now you really get a strong economic incentive to recapture that water and reuse it. Right. Okay. Let's see. Eduardo uh, actually has a couple of questions. First is, is there a difference in the quality of the water source between well water and runoff water in terms of the, the chemicals you find dissolved in it? Yes. Okay. So, so um, we do, I've never run into it myself, um, but, but we, we do have uh, in my own experience with working with growers, but there's certainly the potential with shallow wells and agricultural areas. There's, there's a possibility of getting some pesticide contamination in, in well water. Um, certainly, I mean, we certainly see that in terms of nitrates uh, in uh, San Joaquin Valley. Um, and uh, when it comes to runoff though, uh, you know, we can potentially, if, if, if it's our own runoff from our nursery, then uh, whatever we've put into, um, our uh, pesticide applications um, can certainly end up in our irrigation water supply. If it's a surface water supply, a river or a pond uh, that's open, uh, then both percolation of, um, of subsurface water and any runoff from your neighbors, uh, you, there's definitely a, a risk associated with that. All right, makes sense. Uh, also, how about uh, peat moss versus coconut core in terms of its... Uh, airspace and air holding capacity. Yeah, so so the peat that I showed you was just happened to be a, p a fine peat. And um, if we had a coarser peat, it would have bigger air spaces. In the case of both um, peat and coconut core, uh, you've got a whole range of particle sizes. And so uh, in terms of physical properties, water air balance, um, depending on the, the, uh, the type of peat and the screen of the peat and same with coconut core the part of the husk and how it's screened you can get all kinds of you know ranges from from millimeters in length up to centimeters uh, the biggest issue uh, the, the biggest difference rather in terms of um, physical properties of coconut core versus peat typically happens in terms of wettability when they're dry 
just uh, coconut coir uh, tends to have much better wettability, less, it's less hydrophobic if um, uh, the media dries down uh, a lot, uh, and that's why we need to apply a wetting agent to peat-based substrates, but often are not needed for coir. All right. Do you have any experience with uh, the new wood fiber uh, substrates like hydrofiber? Yeah, I've worked with um, wood fiber for two years, and I did not work with with um, the hydrofiber product, but I did with uh, both Classman and Pinstrip, uh, and both the uh, the raw material as well as the blended material, and um, uh, I like it. I think it's a, uh, a, a substrate that uh, component that is um, it's it's here to stay. It's it's uh, very predictable and repeatable um, as as a material. And uh, you know, I think so long as you're thinking of it as an additive, as a component, and not um, the majority of the mix, then uh, I think that you can. Uh, uh, engineer a substrate with the right chemical water and air type characteristics that you want. And so the, the mixes that we were using were 30% by volume uh, wood fiber. And uh, it was, uh, we were comparing that against uh, peat, 100% peat or peat core or peat perlite. And, um, and we grew very good quality crops. We did not see evidence of nitrogen drawdown at that concentration with wood fiber uh, from Classman and Pinstrip. Uh, we did look at a, um, a whole tree chipped product um, that a grower uh, provided, and we did see some nitrogen drawdown. And you know, one of the research questions we were specifically interested in is if we grew a, if we grew a plant in um, a peat wood fiber product, uh, like a patio container or a hang basket, would we see nitrogen drawdown for the customer? Would there be a, a loss in, in plant longevity, plant quality over time? And we did not see that, not with wood fiber product. Um, the other thing, you know, a couple of things about the, the wood fiber product is it's fairly inert and pH neutral. So um, if you just took um, a peat or bark substrate and replaced a component of that with wood fiber, you would need less limestone in there. Um, and it is more likely that pH may fluctuate because there's not as much pH buffering. Where issues come in are when growers use more than 30% of their substrate being wood fiber because you get a less buffered mix, more possibility of nitrogen drawdown. And um, if you're using a product that is really a whole tree product, then it has some components in there that are more likely to de decompose quickly and uh, have microbes that that uh, lock up some of the nitrogen. But wood fiber is a great product. All right. Dominic wants to know, and I think uh, they're using um, cocoa fiber discs uh, for weed prevention on their containers, wants to know if that would influence mm -hmm. the oxygen exchange between the atmosphere and the substrate. Wouldn't think so. Cocoa discs are pretty porous, but what what do you think? They are porous, and um, and you know it, it, there was a question earlier on about uh, coconut core versus peat. Well, uh, coconut core will dry out pretty easily, and especially on the on the surface of that substrate. And as soon as it dries down even a little bit, there is a lot of air exchange through there. So um, I would not expect there to be a major major effect. All right. Don't put saran wrap over the top of your pots, though. That might be bad. <laughs> That's uh, right. I remember, I remember John Berenbaum doing something quite like that. And um, yeah, there's a lot of evaporation that happens off the top of the mix. So that, that's what helps dry, dry that uh, mix down and not just the plant. That sounds like John. A uh, couple more we're going to get to. Otherwise, we're going to go on all day. But for those we don't get to, don't worry, I'll share his email in a minute. Uh, let's see, Matthew's on a budget, I think. He wants to know how to filter a high volume of water, over 1,000 gallons, gallons a minute, with low capital. Okay, how to filter a uh, high volume, volume with... Okay, More than 1,000 so gallons a minute. The, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd say you've got to use one of those bio swale kinds of things, and don't expect it to go fast, real fast. You get 1,000 in, but are you going to get 1,000 out? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and, and 
unfortunately, um, it all depends what you're filtering out and where you are trying to, at what point you're trying to filter. Um, so, um, you know, I, I could give you the example of Altman plants in California. And if you go to cleanwater3.org, there is a very nice case study written by uh, the University of California Davis team that goes through some of the investments that Altman's did. And they are, they are, um, are uh, filtering um, at a very high flow rate and they're using uh, uh, sand filters in parallel. So their runoff comes into a, a collection pond where there'll be some settling, settling out of particles. It then goes, uh, goes through uh, sand filters. And in their case, that goes then to a second pond and then gets pumped pump from there but uh, rapid sand filters would be would be one of those options all right well we got a couple more here uh, Peter wants to know where can we research pond aeration systems because you were just kind of on that topic any good resources yeah where can you um, well you know I, I think one of the uh, uh, just to give a shout out to to one of our suppliers here is uh, I know uh, dram uh, water is um, uh, provided aeration systems to to a lot of uh, our leading growers, and then I, I would also just say um, that um, uh, that there are um, resources, extension resources. Uh, I know I've got them in the water course I'm teaching right now. I, I'll make sure to pr put something up into cleanwater3.org. The other thing is, if you go to cleanwater3.org and you uh, subscribe to our newsletter, then we're sending out um, extension articles and research articles about every two weeks. So I'll put that one on the list because I think it's a great question. All right. And I just tried backing the slide up to uh, to show that uh, the uh, the URL for that, and it didn't go, but let's see if we can... Uh, uh, if, okay, here we go. Well, if you have more questions, we didn't get to quite all of them, but uh, that phone you just heard ringing was Paul's wife saying, you're late for lunch or something. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but if you have questions, as I know you do, or you want to follow up, uh, here he is, Dr. Paul Fisher, pfisher at uf. Dot edu and I'm sure he'll uh, he'll be happy to help you in any uh, way he UF, can. Yeah, actually, uh, there should be uh, ufl.edu there. Ufl.edu. Oh my gosh, my apologies. Ufl University of Florida, not just the University of F. Very good. Ufl.edu. <laughs> uh, and if you want to relive the whole uh, the whole beautiful webinar uh, or share it with your colleagues. Uh, you can do that at growertalks.com slash webinars. Give me an hour or two to get it uh, archived, and it'll be good to go pretty much forever. And uh, one last thanks to uh, BASF for sponsoring this. I know they help out with Paul's research as along with some of the other uh, the uh, uh, folks that we do webinars with. So thank you, BASF. That said, um, well, on behalf of Paul and all of his waterlogged colleagues, uh, at the University of Florida, go Gators. Uh, and for all of my staff here at Ball Publishing who work overtime making me look good, this is Chris Beatty saying so long, everybody.